Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Museum of American Finance. Hi, I'm David Cowan, the president of the museum. And whenever I give an opening talk here, I always highlight two things. First, of course, is our core mission, which is to preserve, exhibit, and teach about the nation's finances and financial history. And the second thing I highlight is we are a Smithsonian affiliate. Now, we have been an affiliate. Uh, for over 15 years, and we're very proud of that. We're one of just about 200 affiliates that are in this nation that have the privilege. Uh, joining us tonight, either now or will be coming, are three other affiliate museums that are in the local New York area. We're going to have Jasna Rodinich from the managing director of the National Jazz Museum. That's in Harlem. You'll also find Joel Levy, the president and CEO tonight of the Center for Jewish History. And Sean Choi joins us from the director. He's the director of a marketing and community the engagement from the Flushing Council on Culture and the Arts. Also in attendance tonight is our founder and chairman of the Board Emeritus, John Herzog. Now, being an affiliate gives us access to terrific resources, and during the reception, I encourage you to go look at our gold exhibit where we have several dozen objects that are on loan from the Smithsonian as part of our affiliates program. And another advantage is that we have the opportunity to have great speakers like tonight in Richard Curran. Now, Richard is the acting provost and the undersecretary for museums and research at the Smithsonian. His training is as a cultural anthropologist and I learned just last week when I was with him that for some time he was a New York City yellow cab driver. So what better place to learn about cultural anthropology than in the front seat of a yellow taxi. He is a former Fulbright Fellow. He has a PhD from the University of Chicago. He has researched and written on everything from Urdu to the Hope Diamond. His latest book and what he's here tonight to discuss is The History of America in a 101 objects. And this is pretty difficult. The Smithsonian has millions upon millions of objects, and I don't know how he whittled it down to 101. But in the book, you're going to learn about everything from the Declaration of Independence uh, straight through to Dorothy's ruby red slippers from the Wizard of Oz. They've got a Mercury 7 spaceship all the way through to R2-D2. After uh, our talk tonight, Richard would be happy to autograph a, a copy of the book if you would be so inclined to buy one. Now, in the foreword of the book by Wayne Clough, he is the former secretary of the Smithsonian, he says that Richard is, quote, unquote, one of the Smithsonian's living treasures. And for me, that's a great phrase to introduce him on. Here is one of the Smithsonian's living treasures, Richard Curran. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, David. Thank you, all of you. Um, I've been at the Smithsonian about 40 years, so I've uh, been there for uh, for a long time, and um, was involved early on with uh, John Herzog, the founder of this museum. Uh, in really, and, and it's been great to see this museum come of age, uh, be shaped, and have such a vital and robust relationship uh, with the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, not all the museums are in Washington, as you know. We have a few museums here in uh, in. New York, uh, the Cooper Hewitt, uh, uptown on uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, and a, a, a part of the Native American Museum down in Battery Park in the uh, Customs House. So um, let me give you a cab ride through the Smithsonian. You know, there's something to that. Look, I, 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 as a working class kid in, in New York growing up, first generation uh, uh, immigrant, Jewish, first in my family born here, first to go to college in, in that generation, but I loved museums. I used to go down, you know, for you get a subway token and you can go around the world in New York. I go to the Natural History Museum and you can go back in history and you can go across the globe and all you needed was a subway token. And so very very young I appreciated the, the ideas of museums and uh, it really had a great opportunity when I worked, started, was I was in a graduate student, started working for uh, uh, the Smithsonian. Um, and. Uh, a few, uh, two years ago, uh, Penguin Books had come to me. A guy named Neil McGregor of the British Museum had written a book called A History of the World in a Hundred Objects. And it did pretty well. The bestseller sold a lot. So Penguin called me up, the publisher, and they said, you know, Richard, how about doing a book on American history? 
he says, well, I don't know. Well, I, you know, I had to weigh that discussion. I do what I always uh, do when I have a decision to make. I ask my wife. And uh, she teaches first grade, which is good training for dealing with me. <laughs> And so um, she said, yeah, you know, we don't teach American history in school anymore. We really don't. And I think it would be a good idea. So I went back to Penguin. I said, okay, uh, you know, I'll do this. I said, yeah, you know, we really liked, I had written a book uh, on the um, Hope Diamond a few years ago, and I presented it at this museum, the Hope Diamond, very famous. And they liked the way I treated it. So they said, no, no, you really got to do this book. We want you to do this book. I said, but I have one condition. They said, What's the condition? I said, well, you know, that British guy, he did 100 objects. We're American. We need 101. <laughs> so that's how it got to be 101 objects. So uh, people here have been to the Smithsonian in Washington. OK, a few of you, OK. So uh, as I said, mo you know, most of our museums, uh, uh, save for two, are uh, in, in uh, 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 that are in New York or in Washington. We have at the Smithsonian, uh, hard to see, uh, 139 million objects in our collection, technically called stuff. That's the museum term. And uh, we have millions of more of uh, archival documents, photographs, films, and other media. It's, it's the largest collection on the planet. Again, this is what it looks like behind the scenes. Again, maybe hard to see in the back here, but just millions and millions and millions of things. And to pick out 101 out of that is no easy task, and you can ask me how I did it later on. But what I wanted to do was really provide a very broad notion of American history. So the first object in the book is a little uh, uh, um, uh, surprising. Uh, meet the first Americans. <laughs> Uh, actually, they're Canadian, technically. <laughs> These are fossils from about 500 million years ago enmeshed in what we call the Burgess Shales. These are slabs of slate. They come really from British Columbia. Uh, they were discovered in the early part of the 1900s by Smithsonian scientists. And they really document life, what life looked like in North America. And some of these forms then evolved into other forms. Others were evolutionary dead ends. But it gives you a sense of what life looked like in what's now the United States or North America 500 million years ago. The last object in the book isn't quite in the Smithsonian. It's called the Giant Magellan Telescope, and the Smithsonian's in the midst of building this. This is a billion dollar telescope. It would not fit in the Smithsonian. We're building this on a mountaintop in the Atacama Desert of Chile. Now, to give you an idea of the size, I don't know if you can see that red arrow there, but that points to the size of a human being. <laughs> that telescope is about 100 feet across. That telescope will allow Smithsonian and other astrophysicists to see back, see so far in space, you will see so back in time, very close to the Big Bang. It will enable us to detect life in the universe. It'll enable us to understand black holes. So that's the last object in the book, kind of looking uh, forward. In between is a of other objects. And w when we talk about objects in museums, the objects in museums are not just to put in a case, as, as strong as that is, but it's also to study. Because the objects form kind of the evidence. They are the material evidence, just like in a trial. You know, you have to show evidence. It's not just talk. The stuff in museums is the evidence of history, of creativity, of accomplishment. And we study that evidence. So we got an ornery guy in anthropology at the Smithsonian, this guy Dennis Stan uh, Stanford. Now, the conventional theory about how people came into North America was uh, through um, Siberia and the Bering Strait. They passed by Sarah Palin's house on the way to the Rockies, and they then populated the Americas. That's the conventional theory. And people think that happened about 12, 13, 14,000 years ago. But Dennis has been finding these Clovis points, which are the earliest technology documenting Paleo-Indians, uh, the first peoples in North America. And he's been finding old samples in the Chesapeake Bay and in New England. 
And when he starts to compare them, he can find comparable Clovis points in Siberia, but he finds them in Northern Europe. And so he's th he thinks, and he's a minority view, and he argues with other people at the Smithsonian, but his view is that people first started coming into North America somewhere around 20,000 years ago and really came up through Iceland, Greenland, Newfoundland, and down into, into the country. So what's his evidence? Well, he studies these Clovis points. It's the stuff in the collection that gives him that, uh, uh, makes him believe that. Um, we have at the Smithsonian everything from pre-Columbian uh, items documenting ancient uh, Native American civilizations to the first uh, portrait of Columbus to things from the Southwest to a wonderful portrait of Pocahontas done in 1616 when she visited England. We even have in the Smithsonian a curator, actually it was only a few years ago, he was looking through the collection, but wasn't in the right place and he found a piece of the rock. What did he find? A piece of Plymouth rock that had broken off very early that was inscribed. And of course, items like slave shackles that document slavery in our country. Now, at the Smithsonian, we have some of the touchstones of American history. This was a guy that, you know, kind of used to walk around right out here on the street. Uh, George Washington, the uniform of George Washington, the sword of George Washington. Washington was very sensitive about how the American military looked, particularly officers. He had served in Braddock's in the, the Virginia militia as a British officer. And he wanted Americans, American officers to look dignified. So Washington even helped, helped design the uniform. Of course, he had one problem in coming up with the uniform to make Americans look dignified. We were still a pretty much a frontier people. We didn't make really good cloth. And so he had to order the cloth for the uniforms from England. <laughs> 